Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and joining me are my co-host, Coindesk Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Lewitton, and Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, Emily and Lawrence. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you had a good weekend. Let's take a quick look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin had a great weekend. The Coindesk Bitcoin Price XBX Index currently trading at $47,315. Bitcoin is up over 3% over the past 24 hours, of course, over the weekend, hitting 48000 The Coindesk ETX Index right now at 3285 ETH is up over 4% for the day. And the new DFX Coindesk's DeFi index is currently trading at $746. What's going on? Refresh, refresh. There it is, $746. DeFi is also up. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. So looking at our top story, I mean, everyone has been talking about the tragic events in Afghanistan, people being airlifted out, uh, allies, American allies being airlifted out as the Taliban gains control of the country after uh, two decades. Um, very, very challenging, troubled times. Meanwhile, we are also seeing Bitcoin going up 48,000. Lawrence, I, I, I don't think they're, on it. No, they're, they're not related. Um, the, 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 the sheer lack of, uh, I, 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 I'm going to keep my opinions to myself regarding um, the horrific uh, uh, actions by the current administration to abandon our allies. But uh, that's aside from the point here. Uh, yeah, Bitcoin is... Uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is up a little bit on uh, still light volume. You, you're still seeing these large flows uh, happening in the exchange, these, these one-shot deals. What, what, what I noticed, though, that was interesting was that Bitcoin dominance is now back to 43%. It's down. It was roughly around here back in May when Bitcoin was reaching all-time highs. In January of this year, when Bitcoin had was about 20000 or so, it was actually a little bit uh, higher than that. Um, Bitcoin's dominance was 62%. So a lot of this, if we have to think about it, a lot of this uh, 2 trillion market cap that we're seeing in crypto, which we finally re-broached re, uh, uh, this past weekend, is in the alts. So it's, this isn't just a Bitcoin story to be sure, although a lot of it could be Bitcoin pulling up the uh, alts with it. But uh, the, the size mm -hmm. of the, big, the crypto market is still very much uh, tied to the alts, particularly Ethereum, uh, if you will, if you still want to consider that an alt or, or, or another major currency and some of the mm -hmm. others. I'll say this about Afghanistan. If, if you've ever read Michael Casey's book, The Age of Cryptocurrencies, it opens up with Parisa Ahmadi, who is an Afghan girl who was working as a film blocker and earning Bitcoin and was able to open an account, a, tale, a classic tale of banking the unbanked. And she was able to purchase a laptop of her own through Amazon gift cards. And it's to women like Parisa that I, I hope that are safe and are doing okay. And Emily, any thoughts? We, as we well? just betrayed her. Yeah, I think it's interesting no matter what. I mean, you know, that we have this incredible global instability right now, and yet we have Bitcoin up. I mean, that could be one of two things. It could either be that Bitcoin is somehow reacting to global instability, which again, as Lawrence said, we don't know for sure is happening, or Bitcoin is just a completely independent animal that doesn't react to world events, which is also interesting, right? So I think we're just going to have to see um, if these two trends continue to go in separate directions. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the IRS will reportedly ignore how the United U.S. Senate infrastructure bill defines a broker for expanded crypto tax reporting purposes. Guidance on the matter from the Treasury Department could come out this week, according to a Bloomberg report. Apparently, the Treasury will not go after crypto firms such as miners that don't meet the tax code's definitions of a broker. And joining us now to discuss is Fred Thiel, CEO of North American mining giant Marathon Digital Holdings. Welcome to the the show, Fred. So, you know, as you saw this infrastructure bill go through the legislative process, I, I wonder, it, it might have been frustrating for you, but I wonder what is your reaction? Because we haven't really heard from miners on this topic. And is this a 
bad thing for minors? Are should should minors be concerned about it? Um, well, I think we take a slightly different perspective on it. The simple fact that the Senate and now the House of Representatives and uh, legislatures are looking at crypto as being a funding source for taxes, um, and especially looking at things like mining, et cetera, says that they're taking crypto very seriously and that crypto will be here to stay. It is now firmly, firmly in the mainstream. And we believe that this is actually a very good thing because the fact that the government is looking at it as a source of taxation means that they plan to have it around for quite a long time. So I think that's a sign of confidence in Bitcoin. As a miner, you know, we're not um, facilitating transactions between people on behalf of somebody and getting paid for it in a direct typical sense. We're, you know, ensuring the security of the blockchain, we're processing transactions. Um, and in the cases where we would be transferring Bitcoin to somebody, say one of our pool members, then it's a simple 1099 reporting process. So unlike a an exchange or a trading house that has, you know, thousands or millions of transactions a day, um, a mining pool uh, like the one we operate is, you know, one transaction per day per member of the pool. And today in our pool, we're the only member, um, but we will soon grow that. And uh, I, I think it, it's not a huge thing for miners, especially in the Bitcoin space. So Fred, have uh, you been in contact with anyone in Congress? I just follow Congress? up on that point for for a moment. Um, so you said that, um, you know, it's not that big a deal for miners, but that's pretty much the opposite of what the crypto industry has been saying. I mean, they have been completely warning that this is going to drive miners outside of the United States. And even though you said that, yes, you know, your transactions would be classified under these new tax requirements, the argument that's being made is that even though miners don't fit into these sort of new tax rules, they'd still be subject to these tax rules, and thus would have no way to comply with U.S. regulations, and thus would leave the United States en masse. Like, that's definitely what crypto advocates have been warning. So are you saying that that's a little bit overstated, or that's something that's not, not likely to happen, even in the worst case scenario in which this bill just goes through in its current form? So you have to think about this tax rule has to do with reporting. Um, it doesn't implement a new tax on miners. It doesn't implement a new tax on software developers. It doesn't implement a new tax on node operators. It's simply a reporting requirement that if you um, are transacting and uh, facilitating transactions, you would have to report those transactions. So it, it's not a taxation issue in the sense that miners are going to have to pay more taxes. We're a U.S. taxpayer today. Every Bitcoin we receive, we have to pay taxes on. Uh, that hasn't changed. What's changing is simply the reporting requirement. I think the issue is more for node operators, uh, validators, you know, outside of the proof of workspace, as you move into the Ethereum world, it may have potentially a bigger impact. But I think really within the Bitcoin mining space, within the proof of workspace, um, it's really more one of just reporting. And uh, you know, miners are not selling coins to lots of individuals. Most miners are hodlers, they hold their Bitcoin. And when they do sell Bitcoin, it's typically in block transactions. And so those would be fairly easy to report. So you know, I'm not trying to make the situation um, or minimize the situation. I'm just saying the impact to miners really isn't that severe. Uh, we believe though, however, that the law needs clarification because um, as the law is written today, it's open to implementation differences. So as you as you reported earlier, the Treasury Department is about to provide guidance as to how the IRS is going to um, implement this. Well, that can change from year to year. If it's written correctly in the law to properly exclude miners, to properly exclude software developers, and properly exclude node operators, then you don't have those implementation risks. So I think the key issue here is to try and get the law amended properly such that uh, the bill amended properly, such that there isn't an implementation risk going forward because the Treasury Department could very well change their implementation uh, recommendations down the road. So Fred, have you been in touch with anyone in, con in Congress or the Treasury to uh, discuss this, uh, to discuss the reporting requirements? And uh, is it, it, your, your take that, that this isn't too much of a problem for miners, is that the reason why we're seeing relative silence or at least... Uh, not as much vocal activism on the part of uh, U.S. miners re regarding uh, the recent infrastructure bill? Well, I think that's certainly a safe assumption to make. Uh, we work very closely uh, and we're an executive uh, uh, level member with the Digital Chamber and Perry Ann Boring and her team have done an excellent job at really working with some of the key senators who were involved in crafting the amendments 
uh, or the attempted amendments to the bill uh, in trying to get the miners' perspective uh, and you know key constituents within the uh, the crypto spaces um, opinions in front of the proper uh, senators and legislatures, and, and I think they're con- going to continue to do a great job. So um, I have a question just more generally about miners in North America. I mean, there's, you know, with China cracking down on mining, it seems like an opportunity for, for, for North America. I'm curious where you see the opportunities are geographically, specifically in the U.S. And also, um, do you think that mining is a actual form of job creation for the U.S.? And if so, like, could you give a sense of like how many jobs we might be talking about? Um, so um, two very different questions. Uh Geographically speaking, North America, I think you're going to see mining expand um, where there are uh, there's access to very inexpensive power and good renewable power. So in the um, Canada and in the northwest of the U.S. Uh, and in the northeast, you have hydropower. Uh, so you're going to see more miners uh, migrating there for, who previously weren't mining in North America. You're also going to see miners going to places like Texas, where the ERCOT grid is a, a non-regulated grid. So those are great places. You know, we've all announced that our next big expansion is in Texas. We also have miners in Montana uh, and Nebraska, South Dakota. So I think you're going to continue to see states where there's access to inexpensive power will be primarily the places where miners migrate to. Um, you know, a- as you look just generally uh, around this uh, issue of job creation, you know, mining requires people who see look after the machines. Uh, you know, mining. Um, fleets constantly need to be touched. Uh, we're not talking of thousands of jobs per mining facility. It's, you know, more in the, you know, 10s to 20s, multiple shifts. So you maybe might be able to get up to 100 people. Larger mining facilities where you have gigawatts of power and you have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miners, those numbers grow, of course. But um, it's not like in the manufacturing industry, where if you're going to manufacture so many cars, you need so many manufacturing laborers. Uh, you know, mining is like data center operations, Um, just the same kind of impact as if Google or Microsoft or Apple were to open a new data center. So Fred, you had a, you had a really good quarter uh, this past, uh, you you reported this past week, you had a a, three X what your first quarter was. And I think it was a nine, 10 X of the previous year. But one thing that was interesting was uh, your investment fund, that Marathon has an investment fund. They bought about $150 million worth of Bitcoin, about 4,800 Bitcoin. Uh, why not use that money instead to buy uh, miners instead of just Bitcoin? Well, um, if you think back to uh, earlier this year, we had over $500 million in cash. We had open orders with Bitmain for 100,000 miners. And the outlook was that we potentially, uh, you know, there may not be good supply of miners at the right price um, in the uh, early part of 2022. Uh, And so we decided to put our money to work. Uh, You know, treasury management is a core function of managing any company's assets. Being a public company, we have to worry about our fiduciary duty to properly manage the assets of our shareholders. We believe that putting it in Bitcoin was the best investment. Uh, opportunity. Uh, Similar to Michael Saylor, we're big believers in the fact that Bitcoin is an ideal store of value for a certain portion of corporate treasury funds. And we followed suit. We bought $150 million of Bitcoin, which at its peak had a rather significant gain. And even year to date, uh, we're still up on that investment. And it's been much better than placing that money in alternative places. Um, would that make you overexposed, though, to Bitcoin specifically, to make it, since you are a Bitcoin miner? I mean, why not, if you still want to keep it in the crypto markets, why not invest it, say, in ETH or in, or in some other coin rather than Bitcoin, which you're already mining and, and receiving those, uh, those coins? Why not try to at least diversify just in case? Is that, is that a, a potential risk on the balance sheet there? Um, you know, I think we are a Bitcoin balance sheet risk as a company. If you think about it, we have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars invested in Bitcoin mining equipment and facilities. Uh, our whole stock is a proxy for Bitcoin. We are the only pure play miner of the public miners. Most of the other miners operate hosting businesses as well as mining businesses. So there isn't another miner of our scale who is just operates mining. We don't offer hosting to anybody. We're a pure play miner. So in that sense, um, we are very exposed to Bitcoin, but it's also something we know better than any other crypto. We have a lot of faith 
in what's going to happen with Bitcoin. And we believe in Bitcoin. That's why we put our money where our mouth is. So, Fred, we could continuously see mining is coming up as an issue in Congress that's already starting to happen, right? And you're going to need local lawmakers to sort of fight for this industry because there's, it's going to become more contentious. So if mining is not a significant source of job creation, what are the best arguments for why the U.S. needs mining? I mean, what are some of the economic benefits that mining can bring to some of their specific states or to the well, U.S.? One of the key generally? benefits well, to the U.S. or to specific states, remember, we're the consumer of power of last resort. We're also the ideal customer to deploy renewable energy uh, uh, facilities with, because if you think about solar or wind or any type of energy, you can only transmit it 500 miles. So if you're going to build a whole new solar farm to supply solar power to a city, you have to place that within 500 miles of the city or that power won't get to the city. And that's getting harder and harder to do. But being able to deploy renewable energy sources in states where there's wide open land, there isn't a natural energy consumer, allows you to deploy that renewable energy, put mining there as a revenue source for the local population um, relative to not just jobs, but also taxation potentially, depending on where the locus of the miner is from a tax perspective. But you also have the fact that when you deploy mining in, for example, a new solar facility, now the solar facility can talk to the distribution industry, the transmission lines, and get them to build distribution and connect that to the grid, which then provides that electricity to consumers. We're also the single best load balancer for power systems. And if you think about power in the U.S. today, we generate and consume about four terawatts of power as a country. That number hasn't changed in years. As a matter of fact, it's declining to a certain extent. What that means is the many stranded power assets that otherwise are being shut down. If you were to look um, at the number of power plants that are under effectively being wound down, uh, you know those are jobs being lost today. Uh, those are jobs that are disappearing from communities because of migration of people. Power plant is not needed anymore. And so as Bitcoin miners start going to those abandoned plants, restarting those plants, and that's essentially what we did in Hardin, Montana. We took a power plant that was pretty much idle other than operating maybe two months of the year and brought it up to full capacity. In doing that, we did two things. We provided jobs to the people at the power plant, but more importantly, an Indian reservation, the Crow Nation, which uh, on whose ground the power plant lies and from whom the uh, power generating energy source is taken, receives a royalty uh, on that power generation, essentially, um, uh, in the millions of dollars a year, which they otherwise wouldn't receive. So there's a huge social benefit to that tribe from us mining in a place where otherwise right. that power plant would be shut down and idled. Right. Well, we do see uh, Marathon growing at a record clip uh, for going from two eggs a hash to over 13 eggs a hash by the this time next year, according to some of your notes. And uh, your Mara pool is one of the top five pools globally. And I'm just taking a look at your stock over 1%. So it's uh, looking like a good quarter for you, Fred. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you very much. Always happy to be on. That was Marathon Digital Holding CEO Fred Thiel. Coming up, checking in on Asia and the crypto markets update with Digital Asset Manager 2 Prime. for the daily forecast and update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Justin Solomon of Forecast News. Welcome to the daily forecast, August 16th, 2021. I'm Justin Solomon of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain, filling in for Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Coming up, Solana price hits an all-time high. India's GoSats launches a Bitcoin reward cash back card and a new survey shows Asia leads the way on crypto ownership. Now let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. First up, Solana's price has surged in the last 24 hours. The spike follows the launch of a new NFT project on Solana's blockchain. The 
Degenerate Ape Academy NFT. Forecast News' Lucas Caccioli has more. The Degenerate Ape Academy sold out its collection of 10,000 unique ape NFTs in just eight minutes over the weekend. And added to that, Wormhole 2.0, a communication bridge between Solana and other top DeFi networks was launched on mainnet just last week. It allows tokenized assets to move seamlessly between blockchains. One expert told Forecast News such moves are key to the future of DeFi. I'm a big believer in the long term in interoperability between lots of different chains. I think we will see bridges. So again, it'll be like users will will kind of seamlessly kind of transact and migrate between change, between chains. And my actual long term view is users won't even know what, what base layer they're using. Both those moves saw Solana's price begin a surge that continued into the beginning of the Asian trading week, hitting an all-time high of 64 US dollars and 48 cents, before falling slightly as of 3 p.m. Hong Kong time on Monday. Solana has now flipped Uniswap to claim 10th spot on the coin market cap crypto rankings. For Forecast News, I'm Lucas Caccioli. Meanwhile in India, a Bitcoin cashback rewards card has been launched. The prepaid debit card allows shoppers in the country to spend rupees but receive rewards in Bitcoin. It's another move towards wider adoption of crypto assets in India and it comes at a time when government discussions on cryptocurrency regulations remain at a standstill. Here's Forecast News' Monica Ghosh with more from Pune, India. In a tweet, Gosat said the card will allow shoppers to earn up to 100% of their spend as Bitcoin cashback with the premium gold card, as well as offering the chance to win one full Bitcoin with every transaction on all cards. Gosats will release 5,000 cards in the first batch, allowing payments with major brands online, including Amazon, Flipkart, and Starbucks. The card is being produced in partnership with the National Payments Corporation of India, or NPCI. The NPCI introduced rupee cards in India, which are similar to Visa or MasterCard but geared to the local market. That partnership is interesting as the NPCI is a non-profit organization that was launched by the Reserve Bank of India and the Indian Banks Association. The RBI has stated that while cryptocurrencies are not illegal, it has major concerns over them. And while the government remains undecided on the future of cryptocurrencies, Indian companies continue to make strides towards greater adoption as we saw last week with the introduction of Uno coin crypto gift vouchers. For forecast news. I'm Monica Ghosh, Pune, India. And finally today, it looks like Asia rules the school where cryptocurrency adoption is concerned. According to the latest crypto report from independent product comparison platform Finder, the top five countries for crypto ownership are all in Asia. Finder's survey asked over 40,000 people in 27 countries around the world whether they own crypto and Vietnam proved to be the runaway winner. 41% of respondents there said yes, they do own crypto. Interestingly, while the Vietnamese government asked the country's central bank to study the use of cryptocurrencies in July, the State Bank of Vietnam previously stressed they are not legally recognized. Indonesia, India, Malaysia, and the Philippines made up the remainder of the top five with ownership rates between 28 and 30%. Well, in the US and UK, those levels are less than 10%. In a blog post, Binance says drivers for adoption include the ability of stable coins and the rise of DeFi and NFTs. But for South Asian nations, international remittance could be the key. The World Bank says such remittances are larger than all other capital inflows combined. And with digital fund transfers becoming cheaper and more accessible, they are only on the increase. That suggests crypto could prove a great tool for alleviating poverty. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Justin Solomon. Until next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Let's have a live look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is Bitcoin price. XVX index currently trading at 47,113. Bitcoin is up about 2.5% over the past 24 hours. And the coin is Ether price. ETX index is at 3,271. ETH soaring up about 3.7%. 
over the day. And the new DFX, Coinesx DeFi index is at 746, also taking a bit to refresh on that page. We'll get back to it. All right, joining us now to discuss the crypto markets is Alexander Blum, managing partner at Two Prime, a crypto asset manager. Hi there, Alex. So over the weekend, we saw Bitcoin climb above $48,000. The crypto markets are above $2 trillion market cap. Would love to get a bit of your analysis on the markets right now. Yeah, I think uh, obviously crypto in general is back on the ascendancy after a couple months of pretty low or steady kind of low volatility conditions. Uh, I think that's a blend of both technical and fundamental factors. Uh, we've seen um, a ton of you know, potential FUD that's had almost no impact on the rising price of Bitcoin from U.S. regulation to the disruption of Chinese miners. And every time one of those things is addressed, it's effectively one less risk factor to the long-term viability of crypto, Bitcoin, and, and Ether in general. Um, beyond that, I think we've seen from the, you know, our fund is focused on the derivatives market, and we've seen an uptick both in the volume of both spot and derivatives being traded, and then things like the future spread, so the, the premium you pay to buy a Bitcoin or Ether future is going back upwards. It was in the negative or flat uh, range for a couple months there, which indicates a bearish or neutral um, perspective on what's gonna happen. And now we see it back up around eight to 10% on an annualized yield basis for Bitcoin and Ether futures. Uh, the same with options skews. So the purchasing behavior of, of calls is starting to uh, trend more bullish as well, especially into the latter half of this year. Interestingly, I think also you notice that Ether futures and Ether skew is slightly more bullish than that of Bitcoin, uh, suggesting that at least the derivatives market believes that there's more upside in Ether at present. So, Alexander, we're, we're seeing this kind of move happen while volumes generally are, are lower than they were back in May, not just in dollar terms, but also in terms of the actual coins that are being traded. They're much lower than they were um, when prices were just about where they were uh, earlier in the year. Is there some concern, at least, that, that there are just a few players now moving around in the market that's kind of creating this, this move up, and yet there might not be any legs to stand on, uh, not enough interest besides just these few players, and we don't know why they're, they're participating in the market just yet. Is, is there some concern that that's kind of changing the, the or at least uh, creating a dynamic where you see these higher prices but with lower volume yeah i think that's one uh reasonable narrative i guess as a counterpoint um i would say that it might indicate actually the opposite that you know we had this big spike up in price to sixty four thousand, kind of a frenzy of buying especially on the retail side and then a crash down in lower volumes and now we're rising back up and the volumes they're, they're starting to to rise significantly but they're not where they were uh back a couple months ago and so it suggests that there's still room for that frenzy and that high level buying activity to still occur but we're starting at a higher base floor price and in addition you know a lot of the i'm not sure exactly where you're pulling your uh ex volumes from but typically that's exchange volume and a lot of the big buying goes on via yeah. otc like you know we buy millions of dollars of Bitcoin, and it doesn't show up on those metrics because uh, we're buying at OTC just from a, a direct counterparty. And so uh, if you see more institutional buying as opposed to retail, it might not show up necessarily as a higher volume on, on some of those uh, uh, ways of tracking it that, that you see publicly. So the big story of this weekend was Afghanistan, not crypto. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about where this major global story fits into crypto. I mean, does will, will what's happening in Afghanistan have an effect on the crypto markets or not really? Um, you know, I think generally, right, like when there's more political instability and more quantitative easing or, you know, reckless money printing, it, that's all uh, benefits something that's a hard asset that has a finite supply and is immune to political or policy decisions or reckless wars and all of that. You know, I don't think the people in Afghanistan this week are probably moving the price of, of Bitcoin too greatly, but I, you know, I think it does, you know, slightly reduce the standing of the United States and its power in the world, which thus reduces the power of the, the dollar as the, the global reserve currency, which uh, can only help other currencies like uh, Bitcoin, for example. But I don't think like uh, I don't think Afghanis are like buying Bitcoin to such extreme volumes or people are buying, you know, Bitcoin because they're worried about Middle East instability in, in a way that would change the price too, too drastically. 
Mm -hmm. All right, Alexander, we got to end it there, but thank you for coming on the show and offering your analysis. Also, I saw that 2Prime recently published the Trader's Guide to Institutional Crypto and DeFi. So if you're getting into the markets right now, it might be worth a read for our viewers out there. That was 2Prime Managing Partner Alexander Blum. Coming up, the first crypto unicorn out of India, as well as Coindesk Global Policy Regulation Update with Managing Editor Nick Day. Coindesk Indexes, the market standard for crypto assets since 2014. The Coindesk DeFi Index is our latest product and provides insight and exposure into decentralized finance. Our indexes are key for investors looking to access and understand crypto markets. The Coindesk DeFi Index is the best tool for a diversified approach to this compelling new category of digital assets. The Coindesk DeFi Index, measuring the investable DeFi market. It's that time to check in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor, Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk, the State of Crypto Newsletter. Happy Monday, Nick. So tell me hey, what you've morning. been watching over the weekend. Good morning. Yeah, so late last week and into the weekend, Bloomberg reported that the Joe Biden administration is considering tapping acting CFTC Chair Rostin Benham as a, uh, for a full term as the head of the agency. So uh, it's a pretty interesting signal. Um, you know, we've heard reports and rumors that it's been quite a while. Quite a few names have been floated to head the commodities and derivatives regulator. But, uh, you know, if Mr. Benham is tapped for a full term, it's a little bit of stability at the position, but also kind of signals where and how the Biden administration is looking at, you know, some of these issues, which will include crypto. So, Nick, uh Biden is, of course, adopting uh, Trump's uh, Afghan policy, Afghanistan policy. So now he's also adopting his CFTC picks. What what exactly is the uh, congruency, if you will, of Benham and the administration? I mean, so the way that whole, uh, you know, the way CFTC commissioners and even on the SEC side, uh, the way that kind of comes together is you have Republicans, uh, Republican lawmakers specifically, you know, suggesting names for uh, Republican seats. You have Democratic lawmakers suggesting names for Democratic seats. So I believe, you know, Benham has the support of the Democratic caucus and he's had it since 2017 when he was first nominated to the position. Uh, so, you know, it, this isn't a complete surprise. Um, you know, and of course, uh, he was voted to be the acting chair uh, at the beginning of this year after former CFTC chair Heath Tarbert announced his resignation. Nick, there was also an update uh, regarding Treasury's possible interpretation of the infrastructure bill. Can you just fill us in on what that is? Yeah, so there was a report last week that Treasury intends to publish guidance uh, kind of clarifying how it's going to interpret the potential legislation within the infrastructure bill. My understanding is that, you know, uh, this might be later rather than sooner. Um, any guidance that might be issued will be, you know, it'll probably be some low level statement rather than, you know, an official edict from the Treasury Department. And we're probably not going to see it for at least a little bit of time. I'm not sure if it's because they're waiting for the House of Representatives to take a look or, you know, if there's other factors involved. But uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like that's going to be, you know, immediately imminent. All right. Well, we'll be watching out for any developments. Nick, thanks for the update. Yeah. I was Quintus, Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. Crypto exchange Coin DCX is the first crypto firm in India to achieve unicorn status, according to Bloomberg. Coin DCX raising about ninety million dollars from investors in a funding round that values the exchange above one billion dollars. Joining us now to discuss is Coin DCX co-founder Niraj Kandaval. Welcome to the show, Niraj. So, congratulations. Are you surprised by your achievement in a country with a hot and cold history towards? Crypto, you know, with the Reserve Bank of India implementing a banking ban on crypto trading, which was struck down by the Supreme Court. And the Modi government is still considering banning Bitcoin and other decentralized cryptocurrencies. Hi, uh, thank you for having me here again. Uh, yeah, uh, 
No, no, not really. Uh, we are not surprised by this. Actually, in fact, we were. Uh, so, so valuation does not matter much. You know what? Uh, what we have been uh, working since uh, last three years is is how to develop the industry in India. How to how to advance the education narrative where we want to educate uh, Indians people as well as the regulators on on the crypto and Bitcoin, uh, right? So we have been working for uh, for uh, in increasing the in size of the industry since past three years and uh, uh, this this uh, uh, funding is i think is just one of the uh, one of the uh, you know uh, steps in that direction so no no it does not come as a surprise but in fact it gives a lot of motivation for us that you know there's a lot of word of confidence that we have got from uh, different players in the industry and uh, uh, you know it lets us work towards our objective so naraj with this kind of new prominence, if you will, because because of this high valuation, uh, it, given that it, also your unicorn status in India, ha, have, has it given you access at all to any members of uh, uh, any legislators or people in the government to inform them, as you, as you were saying before, as you were doing with regulators, about what exactly crypto does in the market and uh, it for for the people of India and and for trading in India. And its importance has it given you a, a chance to explain it in more detail to legislators, for instance, or administrators who otherwise would not know? We we have been talking to legislators, you know, via the via the relevant bodies in the between, like IAMAI, Internet and Mobile Association of India, as well as India Tech. So those are the channels we have already been, uh, you know, talking to various legislators of the parliament and that has been going on since uh, quite a few months uh, of course the effects of us being a, a unicorn or uh, uh, you know uh, being in the news lately uh, the effects of that have uh, you know we'll see that in, uh, in in a few few weeks uh, it's quite too soon but but there have been a couple of other very very good good uh, impact you know uh, good serious effects of of this uh, Mainly, we, it's it, it's getting easier for us to attract talent, right, uh, from from India, uh, hire best of the uh, talent, and also uh, it, it's helping us in building up the partnerships with other key industry players. You know, for example, stock brokers and uh, uh, other financial platforms. So it's getting uh, easy for us to do that, and and couple of other things. So all uh, just not just the legislators, but but across the across the industry, you know, it's it's benefiting us from from all around, and we intend to go deeper uh, into the conversations with legislators also in the few weeks, upcoming weeks, right? It's too soon to say uh, that, uh, but having said that, we have been in touch with the uh, with the, the legislators since quite a few months uh, via the uh, industry bodies. So you have a real inside view, obviously, into the Indian crypto market, which can be very opaque to people outside of India. Are there any interesting things that are happening in the Indian market that are different from the global market? Like, for example, are there specific coins that are more popular in India or specific trading patterns or use cases? Just anything that like the rest of the world might not be aware of? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in India, of course couple of things I can highlight is uh, there are a lot of investors right? in terms of number we have more than 10 million investors roughly between 10 and 15 million investors who are actively invested uh, in the asset class so we have uh, uh, India has a lot of uh, small uh, uh, you know investors invested with say five dollars ten dollars twenty dollars uh, you know that is why uh, that is why low uh, low cost low cost tokens like uh, for example, Matic, Tron, Matic being one of the Indian projects is also pretty famous uh, in India and uh, people, the public is uh, very much into it. Uh, but typically low cost tokens, you know, are, are much more favored uh, in India because of the fact that we have uh, a lot of investors who are uh, small time investors, uh, a lot in number. So that is one, uh, you know, uh, outstanding fact that I would like to say. But apart from that, uh, mm -hmm. Indians, uh, uh, so one one thing is very uh, you know uh, like we don't realize it, but Indians uh, are heavy traders on Binance as well as other uh, major crypto to crypto exchanges, you know, global exchanges, and they produce Indians produce like quite a huge volume. Uh, the numbers are not out in the public, but uh, given the the prominence of, of Indian stock market, especially derivatives, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, 
huge user base, you know, which is using Binance and other uh, other uh, global platforms and doing a lot of volumes. So I think Indians contribute a lot to the global volume. Uh, you know, it's just not visible publicly, you know, geographically. But by some numbers, uh, I think 15% of the Binance volumes come from uh, from Indian investors. So, Niraj, would you say that the Modi government is warming up to crypto? Because the latest we've heard is that they are actually still considering banning private cryptocurrencies in favor of a national digital currency, a digital rupee, if you will. Uh, national digital currency, yes, CBDCs uh, uh, recently, Reserve Bank of India uh, uh, stated very clearly that they are going to go uh, deeper into the uh, launch of a CBDC and they're actively building a plan to, to launch CBDC and they want to come out with that uh, you know plan in by December this this year which is which is really a welcome step uh, by the government and it just shows that uh, uh, the importance the government do you is think giving that to the will, but do you think in as they try to develop one that they will try to limit or curtail the use of private cryptocurrencies Yes and no. Uh, so let me let me explain that. Uh, so uh, when when the government was trying to ban, you know, uh, was trying to bring a bill in the parliament, that was that was around seven to eight months ago, and uh, you know uh, that was more the budget session of the parliament. And post that, uh, the monsoon session of parliament uh, came and went by, uh, and the bill has not been tabled in both these sessions. You know, even though the government showed the intent. And recently, uh, recently we got to know that there is there has been a new commute uh, new committee which has been formed by the government to discuss uh, more on on the aspects of the the bill, right? And and from what we understand, the government is actually uh, you know the the bill in its original form has already been uh, uh, removed from the table, and and the uh, the government is working on a new refined bill uh, which will. Uh, which uh, you know, which is going to allow some of the top crypto assets uh, uh, like Bitcoin. Of course, the government will not allow hundreds and two hundreds of altcoins and uh, you know uh, small cap tokens. That becomes very risky. But uh, uh, a few top assets uh, would be would be allowed, and that is what uh, you know we are hearing and listening. Interesting. Well, Niraj, congratulations on this latest raise. I see that I hear you're going to use the funding to expand your staff to four hundred employees. So. Again, congratulations and thank you for joining us. That was Coin DCX co founder Niraj Kandawal. All right, that's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker and Lawrence Lewton. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with all about Bitcoin. Coming up at noon is the hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.